signal here. All right, so just uh, really good to be back with everyone. Really uh, missed not having the Christmas service because all, I mean, I was sick. I mean, I think probably 80% of us were sick, so we had to cancel that. So really missed that. Missing everybody. Good to see everybody. Uh, hope everyone had an awesome Christmas and a uh, blessed New Year is coming up. So hopefully uh, 2024 will not be what we think it's going to be with an election, but it probably will be. It's probably going to be crazy. So anyway, just enjoy your time before that happens. <clears throat> um, I do want to make one announcement is, um, you know, we're going to Africa February 16th, I think, for two weeks. And one of the things I'm going to, I haven't even told Angie this, so Angie, sorry, uh, is one of the things we're, I'm going to do is try to go on a, on a fast. So I'm going to do some, and I, it's, I haven't decided exactly how I'm going to fast and what it's going to look like, but I'm going to start doing some fasting on uh, January the 8th, Monday, January the 8th, after your birthday. So I definitely do it after your birthday. That would not be good. Uh, I don't know exactly what the fast will look like for me. I'm still praying about it. But just want to say, if you want to join us in some way to do that fast for 21 days, uh, we would love to have you, so come on and join us. We'll do it together, yeah. Um, but, yeah, so I'll, I, I, but I will, once I kind of have clarity on how I'm fasting, I'm going to let you know, because I'm definitely not going to do a straight 21-day fast. I just can't do that with work and stuff. But, you know, I don't want to give you the impression I'm doing this, you know, 21 days of fasting and I'm actually eating, and then you 20. <laughs> anyway, so I'm going to be up front and share with you what I'm going to be doing once I have clarity. So anyway, so hopefully you can uh, join us in that. So anyway, I want to get into the message now. The message, the title of this message is An Unshakable Foundation. And one of the things that I really like to do as we enter into a new year is to seek the Lord and ask the Lord, okay, Lord, what are you saying as we head into 2024? One of the things I learned from the 2019 Trump prophecies is stop trying to get a prediction for the new year. <laughs> I, hope the, I hope those in the, in the charismatic church learned a lesson from that debacle that we're not trying to get a prediction for 2024. You know, the 2024 is a year of war, or 2024 is a year to adore, or 2024 is a year to stop the snore. I don't know. I mean, so, you know, some of that stuff is really strange. I don't even get into that stuff at all. But I do like to find out, okay, Lord, what are you saying as we enter into 2024, Lord, what is the Spirit saying to the church? I'm not looking for a prediction that these three, watch for these three things. It's more of, Lord, what are you saying to us as we enter into a new year? That's the approach I'm taking. And, you know, as I prayed about this, really felt like the Lord laid on my heart to, that this, is, this, this year is very vital for us to establish the, the proper foundation that we would have an unshakable foundation. Everything that can be shaken is going to be shaken. Everything that can be shaken is being shaken, if you haven't noticed it. I mean, it's, it's rippling throughout the governments, the church. My goodness, the church is being shaken right now. Judgment has begun in the house of God, if you aren't aware of that. I mean, things that you never would have thought happened and would ever be possible are being exposed God is exposing things that, that you, it just, you would have never even imagined these things could have happened. And they're happening. They're being exposed. God is exposing things. And so it's very clear to me that, that judgment has begun in the house of the Lord. It's very clear to me that everything that can be shaken is being shaken. And the question we want to answer, the question I want to say, okay, well, how do we respond in that type of situation as God is cleaning house, as God is cleansing his house, as Jesus is coming into the temple and overturning the temple, overturning the tables and cleansing the temple, cleansing the church, as the Lord is doing this, what kind of response is he looking for from us that we would see what God is doing and we would respond appropriately? So, that's kind of where I'm coming from here. So let's turn in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25. And it's a very familiar passage of Scripture, but I just want to start there of, of just setting the context of the time we're living in. 
I don't think it even takes a prophet to be able to tell you Hebrews 12, 25 through 29 is taking place. You can just look and you can look at, the, you can look at governments, you can look at the church, you can look at finances, you can look at the, everything that's going on, COVID, all that's been going on, and you can realize that God is shaking things. God is shaking things. Now, I'm sure not everything that's happening is because of God, but God is shaking things. So let's, let's look at Hebrews 12, verse 25, where the writer of Hebrews says, See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on the earth, much less will we escape who turn for away from him who warns from heaven. And his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth but also the heavens. I believe we're living in that time when God is shaking the heavens and the earth. Now, it's only at the beginning of that, but it's going to intensify as we get closer and closer to the Lord's return. But God is shaking everything that can be shaken. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. We want to build an unshakable foundation, okay? If God is truly shaking everything that can be shaken, that, you know, don't think, well, I'm exempt from that. No, you're, we're all going to be shaken because we live in this world and God is shaking things in preparation for the time, like it says in Revelation eleven fifteen, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever and ever. We're moving rapidly to that time period when God fulfills those prophetic promises and the Lord comes back. And as we go from where we are to where we're going at the, to the second coming of Jesus Christ, we are living at the end of the age. As we are heading towards that time, everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And so the question for us is how, if that's true, if God is shaking everything that can be shaken, and obviously there's much more involved, there's, there is the sinfulness of man, the depravity of man, there's demons, there's all these things wrapped into it. But if God is moving to shake those things, what kind of foundation must we have so that we are unshakable? That's the question. And so God says, yet once more denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, praise God for that. <laughs> praise God that though everything seems as if it's being shaken, we are receiving a kingdom and a king that cannot be shaken. Let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. God is shaking things. Judgment begins in God's house. Everything that has been done in the darkness is going to be exposed. We're living in that time period right now. We're living in that day and age like what Peter 4.17 talks about, 1 Peter 4, 7, talks about that judgment is coming to the world, but judgment begins in the house of God. If judgment is going to come to the earth, you've got to know judgment begins in the house of God. God comes to his church in judgment before he judges the world. And so God is coming in his church in judgment. I know that's not a message you want to start your happy new year off with, but it's, tr it's the truth. You know, would you rather get me, you know, me to get up here and we'll have 2020 vision for 2020 and then COVID breaks out, you know? Those prophecies really failed. <laughs> God is moving in his church to bring judgment, to bring exposure. And so the question we must ask, if that's happening, what kind of people must we be? What kind of foundation must we lay? Now, I just want to say a couple things here. As, as I get into this message more, just to give you some, when I say judgment is beginning in the house of God, just to give you some examples of what I'm talking about. And many of you know that what's happened with IHOP and Mike Bickle, it's a, it's a very, very sad situation. If you, if you haven't heard about it, 
Mike Bickle, a, a very prominent, uh, um, anointed, charismatic leader, has been, uh, allegations have come out of clergy, uh, sexual abuse, and it's, it's a very tough time. It's, it's something, I, when I heard about it in October, it was the, the very last thing I thought would ever happen. I mean, Mike Bickle, to me, was a, was a mentor. I never met him. Um, he was a mentor. He, he, was, he was someone that I listened to. Um, almost every teaching Mike Bickle released from about, two, from about 1997 until 2012, almost 20 years, I listened to every single thing, almost, that he said. I mean, he, God really used him in my life, and he would be the last person in the world I thought would ever, this, this would ever happen to. I remember in 1996, our um, Noel Mann, who came to minister at our church, he, it was just a, a real move of God for us. And Noel Mann, um, through the prophetic word of the Lord, said that this church, Restoration Life, is called to be a John the Baptist, is called to be a forerunner in the spirit and the power of Elijah. You're called to be an Elijah army that makes ready the, the way of the Lord and makes the, the Lord's people ready. And, you know, we, we were hearing this going, okay, is anyone else out there talking about this? You know, does this sound like, okay, this one, this one guy living in Brisbane, Australia, comes and says this, is, you know, is this really the Lord? And then right around that time, I, I don't know, I don't even know how many times, I can't remember that far back, but it seemed like months later, uh, Mike Bickle had a, a Passion for Jesus conference in 1997, and I heard, he preached a message. I've never to this day have heard a message, even my messages aren't like that. <clears throat> that was a joke. But even to this day, um, I've never heard a message like this. I mean, it was like, oh my gosh. I've never heard, it was, I, I can't even describe it. It was so absolutely like God breathed, God speaking, when he was, he was calling for one million forerunners. And this was right after Noel had given us that word. And um, it, it marked my life. It marked mom and dad's life. It marked our lives. And we knew, okay, this is the reason we live. This is the reason we breathe. This is our purpose. This is our divine commission. We are, we are called as forerunners in the spirit and the power of Elijah to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And so, again, after that, I listened to every single thing Mike Bickle preached. And, and so, just, just to say all that, I have been uh, deeply, deeply grieved since October the 28th uh, when I found out about the, the scandal and just have been grieving, have been processing, just trying to figure out how in the world could, could this happen? This, how, how, could, how, could, how could he preach this kind of message, this forerunner message, but be living a secret life that was, you know, how, how could that even happen? I was just really grieving by, grieved by that. I've been processing this. And so some of this message that I'm going to be talking about is coming from my processing of that situation. I just want to share that with you just to be up front is, is okay, these are the things that I felt like <clears throat> the Lord is really trying to emphasize and I've, I've really been thinking about, but I just wanted to set that context. But as we head into this new year, as God is judging his house, as exposure is coming to the house of God, we've got to make sure that we're building on the right foundation, the only sure foundation, Jesus Christ. See, are we building on the things of God or are we building on the God of all things? Are we building on Christ or the things of Christ? We can easily build upon prayer and fasting. We can easily build upon spiritual warfare. We can easily build upon the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We can easily build upon eschatology and Israel and the end times, even the bride being made ready. We can build on all these, these things, but are we building on these things or are we building on Christ? Are we building on the person of Jesus Christ? Is that is it, he is the only foundation that is going to sustain the shaking that's coming. Is are we building on Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ, and upon his words that he spoke? Are we building upon Jesus Christ and his voice to us? You know, Jesus, it's not just his words he spoke in the Gospels, but his living voice that he speaks to his sheep. My sheep know my voice. I, I know them, and they follow me. 
that Jesus Christ, through the indwelling Holy Spirit, is still speaking today, and we want to follow his voice. And so building on the only true foundation that is not going to be shaken when everything can be shaken is the person of Jesus Christ. We've got to come back to that foundation, this person, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Is test yourself. Test yourself. Are you truly building upon him? Are you building on the things of God? Have the gifts of the Spirit become more important? Has Israel become more important? Has the end times become more important? Has, you know, you can name a, a thousand other doctrines that you can build upon and get focused on. You can actually lose focus upon the man, Jesus Christ. And we want to come back to that foundation. The only foundation that will not be shaken is that, is that foundation of Jesus Christ. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. Paul was talking, I love this, Paul was talking and he's, as an apostle, he called himself a wise master builder. He was constructing a foundation, he was building the house of God. And Paul said, according to the grace of God which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. Catch that. We must be careful how we build upon the foundation. Are we adding to it our own selfish ambition? Are we adding to what we want? Are we, are we building on that foundation, you know, things that would distract us from the person of Jesus Christ and those selfish things? We've got to be careful how we build. We've got to be careful how we build. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. See, every one of us, in the day of judgment, are going to be evaluated what did we build our lives, our churches, our families, our ministries upon? Did we build them upon selfish things and things we could glean and things we could get, even using the name of Jesus Christ to get our own will in our own way? Or did we build properly on the foundation of this man, Jesus Christ? Because everything not built on that foundation by his words, by his voice, by his spirit, is going to burn in the fire of God's judgment. Help us. Help us, Lord. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold and silver and precious stones and wood, hay and straw, so gold and silver and precious stones, those things, and I feel intimidated because I have a jeweler staring right at me, but I'm pretty sure those things would survive the fire maybe, uh, but the wood, hay, and the straw would be burned by the fire. And so Paul's saying each man's work will become evident for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. The fire, remember we read in Hebrews chapter 12 that God is a consuming fire. God is a consuming fire. He is a jealous God. He is a consuming fire. Everything that is not like him is going to be burned up in the fire. And so everything that is not like his son, everything that is not built upon his son, everything that is not built by his son in us and through us is going to be burned in the fire. So it's, it's wise to evaluate our lives and ask ourselves, are we building on the right foundation, which is Jesus Christ? Are we building on the right foundation, which is Jesus Christ? Because the day is the, the 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 work will become evident. For the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So now let's talk about six ways to make sure that we are building on the right foundation. Six ways to make sure we're building on the right foundation. I don't know about you, I'll just tell you, I don't want my life to be burned up in fire. I don't want my life's work to be burned up in fire. Even though I'm saved, my life was wasted because I wasted it doing what I wanted to do, even in the name of Jesus Christ, to build my own kingdom. I want to do it by the Spirit. And I only want to do what he's saying to do, when he's saying to do it, and how he's saying to do it. 
So number one is to build your life upon Jesus Christ and his words. Build your life upon Jesus Christ and his words. Let's turn to Luke chapter 6, verse uh, 40, 46. Luke chapter 6, verse uh, 46, where, where Luke is describing his version of the Sermon on the Mount. And Luke is recording what Jesus said. And he's, he's asking the people, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you do not do what I say? See, a lot, so much of the church is saying, Lord, Lord. And the Lord's would say, if you're going to call me Lord, why are you not obeying me? Why are you not doing what I said? Why are you not obeying my voice? Why are you not obeying my words that I wrote or that were recorded in the Gospels? Why are you calling me Lord, Lord, but not do what I say? Everyone who, he, this is what he says, everyone who comes to me and hears my words, think about the words that are in red, and acts on them, not just being a, I'm just adding this here, not being a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, those who hear the word of the Lord Jesus Christ and acts on them, does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house. We're going back to what Paul was talking about as a wise master builder who dug deep. We've got to go deep. One of the big issues of the church today is the shallowness of the, of the Western church. It's so shallow. We're getting our theology from TikTok and Twitter and social media and Instagram. And we don't know, we're, we're, we basically have any access to any resource and we're more illiterate biblically than, we, than any time in church history, it seems like. We've got to go deep. We've got to go deep. You've got to go deep in God. Don't be shallow. Go deep in the Lord. Go deep in the Lord. They dug deep. And they laid a foundation on the rock. The rock is Jesus Christ. The rock is the person of Jesus Christ. The rock is the person of Jesus Christ and the words he spoke in the Gospels. The words in red. I mean, obviously we won't obey the whole Bible, but especially his words. And when a flood occurred and the torrent burst against that house, it could not shake it. Notice that. The unshakable foundation. The unshakable foundation is, upon, is building your life and your ministry. And all that you do upon the person of Jesus Christ, his words and his voice. That is what is unshakable. That is what truly will we'll ensure that we will not be shaken when everything can be shaken because it had been well built. What kind of house are you building? What kind of family are you building? What kind of personal life are you building? What kind of career are you building? What kind of ministry? What kind of church are you building? Is your, is your building well built Will it survive the shakings that are coming at the end of the age? Will it survive even the trials of everyday life? Do we have the right foundation laid? Because if we don't have the right foundation laid, when the storms hit, when the storms come, look at what Jesus said. But the one who has heard and the one who has not acted accordingly. In other words, the one who, we heard, we heard your voice. We heard your words. We, we read about your words in the Gospels and we obeyed. 75%. We obeyed 50%, but we didn't obey everything he said. And he hasn't acted accordingly. It's like a man who built his house on the ground without any foundation. And the torrent burst against it, and immediately it collapsed. And the ruin of that house was great. Don't think that can't happen to you, to me. It can this can happen to us. See, our house can be washed away. Everything can be ruined, saved, but your life wasted at the judgment seat. Wasted. Everything torn down and blown away by the storms of life, shaking your foundation to the very core. Have you built your house well? Happy New Year, by the way. Hope you're enjoying this. See, notice how the Lord says, 
were to build this house. Number one, we're to come to Jesus in intimacy. The one who comes to me, we come to Jesus. Number two is we hear his words, especially his words in red in the Gospels and in the book of Revelation, but also his voice that he speaks to us as his sheep, because his sheep hear his voice. And then number three, act upon what he said. This is where probably most of us fail. Well, I don't know. I mean, probably we fail in all three in some areas. Come to the Lord and develop this intimate relationship. This is really, if you want to, ma- uh, if you want to make this really, really, it's really, really simple. Come to the Lord in an intimate relationship with him. Hear his words in, in the Gospels and his voice. And then obey Obey what he says. Now, you know from indwelling life teaching, we're not talking about obeying in your own flesh and trying in your own flesh to obey God. We talked about that. You don't live for God, you live from God. You don't try to just go out and gr- with teeth gritted and try with your best effort to obey. You obey out of an abiding relationship with Jesus Christ. You, abide, you, 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 you obey from your spirit and your spirit being strengthened, overflowing into your soul, into your heart, and then outwardly empowering you to do what he says. So it's not, it's not like you know, gritting your teeth and trying your hardest with your best effort, living for God instead of li- is, is living from God, not trying to live for God. We talked all about that. It's all about the grace of God that empowers you to do what God's called you to do and to be who God's called you to be, while when you recognize your weakness and your, your great need of him. So the, Jesus said that the one who, who does this, the one who, who simplifies their life to say, okay, I'm going to build my life by coming to Jesus. I'm going to build my life by hearing his words. I'm going to build my life by obeying what he said. Th- those three things, the one who builds his life like this, builds his house and his house is well built so that when the storms come, whether they be the end time storms or whether they just be, we don't even need the end time storms. We've already got enough storms in our life already, I think. Is whether it's the storms of life, the storms of the end of the age, the storms of trials and tribulations, when those storms come, is our house well built and will our house stand? Amen. We're not building on a doctrine We're not building on a favorite thing we like in Scripture. We're building on the person of Jesus Christ. And let me just say this. Do not build... This is is one thing, especially in the charismatic church. Do not build your life... This is one thing we can learn from the IHOP situation. Do not build your life on another man's gifts, revelations, personality, or experiences. Very, very important. This is why there's so much shaking right now going on in, in that, that community is, is and I, I'm getting this really complicated, but a, a significant thing that's go, happening is many built their lives upon this man's revelations, this man's experiences, this man's personality, this man's gifting. You cannot build your life on another man's experiences, revelations, personality, or gifting. I don't care who that person is. I don't care how anointed they are. Is you, do not build your life on another man's revelations or experiences. You know, I learned, I learned this the hard way. You know, when I made a transition from being a good Baptist in about the mid-90s, I, actually, I was never really a good Baptist. I was a, living in rebellion as a Baptist because... <laughs> But I, I had about three or four years I was a good Baptist in college. Um, three or four years as a good Baptist. But I, I made the transition from being a Baptist to a charismatic where I was trying to learn how to minister in the gifts of the Spirit and flow in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Jack Deere's uh, books, Surprised by the Power of the Spirit and Surprised by the Voice of God, were so incredibly helpful to me as I learned, okay, this is, you know, being he was a, a former professor who taught that the gifts of the Spirit had passed away. And, but now he believed the gifts of the Spirit were for today. And he told all these stories, and he was telling these incredible stories about Paul Cain. And I, I just grew up hearing these stories about, you know, I was in my mid-20s, hearing these stories about Paul Cain, and, and like, whoa, 
You mean there's actually someone alive that hears God? It was like on the level of being biblical stuff. I mean, just encountering angels and, you know, I, I can't even think of one off the top of my head, but just these profound, incredible experiences, you know, going places and there would be an earthquake and calling out people's names and being exactly the situation of this. I was like, this is incredible. I grew up on all of these Paul Cain stories. And so I, I put Paul Cain on this pedestal, like with the Apostle Paul and the Apostle John and Daniel. And, you know, that was my own issue. That was my own fault. And then, you know, I don't know how many years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it was revealed that Paul Cain was a practicing homosexual. And you want to talk about the shock of a lifetime. Like, how in the world could someone have that type of revelatory prophetic gift and yet be a practicing homosexual, living in sin? And it was a huge lesson for me to realize I cannot build my life on another man's revelations. I cannot build my life on another man's experiences. I cannot build my life on another man's personality or influence or platform. I must build my life upon Jesus Christ. The church is built upon the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not built upon revelations. It's not built upon prophetic experiences. It's not built upon this person's encounter or that person's encounter. The church of Jesus Christ, Jesus said this in Matthew 16, the, the church of Jesus Christ is built, the rock on which that is built is not Peter. The rock on which it is built is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The church is founded and built upon the revelation of Jesus Christ. If you want a revelation, get a revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the revelation that Jesus builds his church. He does not build his church on prophetic encounters and experiences. Now, Understand what I'm saying. The prophetic is vital. The scriptures tell us. Wage war according to the prophecy spoken over you. We've got to be people. If we're going to have the prophetic word of the Lord in operation in our churches, in our communities, then we've got to just, we've got to, we, we got to steward those well. We've got to fight with those words. We've got to remember what God has spoken, and we've got to see, we've got to obey what he's spoken. After we've tested it, after, you know, it talks about, this is one of the lessons that really hit me after the failed Trump prophecies in 2020 is examine everything carefully. That's where the charismatic church has really failed is we don't want to be one of those people that are like, we don't want to be a Pharisee who has a religious spirit who doesn't critically examine the prophetic word spoken and hold fast to what's good. But the scriptures tell us to do that. We've got to do that. We've got, you know, I don't care if it's me or whoever, whoever's giving a prophetic word or teaching scripture or whatever it is, we've got to examine everything carefully and hold fast to what is good. If it's not the Lord, we don't need to cling to it. We've got to, we've got to hold fast to that which is the Lord. I made, I've made that mistake many times. <clears throat> and we've got to be, I, I've shared this a lot, is Acts 17, 11, is when even the Apostle Paul came to Berea in Acts 17, and he taught them, and the Bereans were noble-minded, and they were very eager to receive the word of God that Paul was bringing. But the Bereans didn't just go, okay, uh, because you're Apostle Paul, I'm just going to accept everything you say without critical examination. No, the Bereans, they examined the scriptures daily to see is what Paul is saying true. And if you want to build your life upon Jesus Christ and his words, I am encouraging you, don't just take what I say as, at face value. Go back to the word of God and examine is, is what I'm saying true, is what I'm saying scriptural. I don't care who it is, whatever teacher out there you listen to, make sure what they are speaking is grounded in scripture, is scriptural, is supported by scripture. That's one of the reasons... I, I do these notes all the time, is you can go back and you can look at the scriptures to make sure what I'm saying is truly in the word. And if I ever say anything that's not in the word, don't accept it. Don't accept it. And that would be go for anyone. <clears throat> See, Jesus, when he told the parable of the sower, when he told the parable of the sower in, in Mark chapter 4, he said one of the things is that one of the things, one of the reasons why many are going to fall away 
is they did not have a firm root in themselves. They heard the preacher, but the word never penetrated their own heart. And if all you do is hear the preacher, if all you ever do is hear the YouTube speaker or the podcast, if all you ever do is read the book, but you don't get the word planted in your heart, please hear this. You are at risk of falling away when the pressure hits. You don't think, okay, well, that won't happen to me. I'm telling you, the scriptures tell us that is if we don't have the Word of God, listen, even one, the young ones in the corner, get the Word of God in your heart. Get the Word of God in your heart. Because if when the pressure comes and the shaking comes and your faith is tested, the question is, did you have the Word in your heart? Or did you just hear what the preacher said? Or did you just hear what the man of God, the prophet said, or the apostle, or your favorite YouTuber, or podcaster, or whatever? Did you hear them and think, okay, I've got it because they have it? No, you need to have the word in your own heart. Number two is don't put your faith in any person. This is especially true in the charismatic church. I think it's true in the whole church. This whole idea of celebrity Christianity, of putting our faith in a person, it's huge. Now listen to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3. Paul said, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in a demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Listen to what Paul said. So that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men. Notice what Paul, he, Paul was coming in. He was trying to build something in, in Corinth. He was trying to build God's house in Corinth. And he was so grieved and burdened. Even Paul was like, I do not want you to build and put your faith and put your trust in me. In fact, I'm coming in weakness, I'm coming in fear, I'm coming in trembling because you can put your faith in my own wisdom. You can put your faith in my experiences or my revelation or my information or my personality or my platform or my influence or whatever it is, my gifting. And Paul said, I am coming and preaching in such a way that you would not put your faith in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Don't put your faith in a person. Put your faith in Jesus. Put your faith in Jesus. I've made that mistake many times. Putting my faith in a person. Putting my trust in, and I'm not talking about we're going to become disillusioned, I mean, disillusioned and cynical. I'm not talking about becoming cynical or distrusting or any of that stuff. But there's a difference between trusting trustworthy leaders and putting your faith in leaders. You see the difference? We can trust trustworthy leaders. And the scriptures tell us to honor leaders. And in fact, one of the reasons why people don't grow is because they don't receive a prophet in the name of a prophet to receive a prophet's reward. They don't receive the leader God's placed into their lives or into you know, whoever you might listen to on the internet. We don't, you don't receive them as that messenger of God, and therefore, without that honor, you can't receive what God wants to speak to you through them. Okay, so there is this place of honor. There's this place of perception determines reception. There's all that's true, but at the same time, it's easy to shift from that place of honor and receptivity into placing your faith and your trust in that person. That's, see what I'm saying? We should not ever place our faith or trust in any man or woman. That's only for Jesus Christ. Our faith and trust is in him, not in any leader in the body of Christ. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 17, verse 5, he said, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. See, Jeremiah was saying, be very careful that you don't trust in man. Be very careful that you don't trust 
in leaders. Be very careful that you don't place your faith in leaders. No matter how anointed, how gifted, how revelatory, how cutting edge, how famous, how influential they might be, your faith is to rest in Jesus Christ and him alone. Now, again, we trust our leader. We trust those who are trustworthy. We honor leaders because that's the key to re receiving from the Lord. But we, our, our faith and our trust is in the person of Jesus Christ and our relationship with him. See, Jesus even knew this. In John chapter 2, Jesus, John wrote about this and said, But Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he did not need for anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. Human depravity is real. Okay, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to make us all cynical. <laughs> like, we don't trust anyone. That's not where I'm going with that. I'm saying, trust leaders. Don't put your trust in leaders. Honor leaders, but put your faith in Jesus. Does that make sense? See, the Corinthian church had this same problem. This is, this is a massive problem in the church today. Whether it, I think it's in Africa, it's in America, it's all around the world. We have these, these people who are following these famous leaders. And Paul had the very same issue in Corinth. The Corinthians, he, Paul was kind of mimicking them or mocking them or kind of just making fun of them a little bit in 1 Corinthians um, chapter 1. He says, some of you say, I am of Apollos or of Peter or of Paul. And Paul's like, has Christ been divided? I wasn't baptized for you or I wasn't crucified for you. Have you been baptized into the name of Paul? And Paul, Paul was basically rebuking the Corinthians and showing them in their immaturity, they were beginning to follow men that God had raised up instead of following Jesus Christ. Huge problem in the church today. And when, you know, I, you know, when you're younger, you do that. When you're younger, you're like, oh, this person said this, and this person said this. I mean, that, probably back when I was listening to Mike Bickle all the time, I was like, yeah, Mike said, Mike said, and, you know, I, you know probably drove people crazy. But, you know, that was immaturity. That's immaturity. When you keep looking to a leader and saying, this person says, this person says, this person says, that's a sign of immaturity. The word should be who we're saying. The word says, the Lord said, not this person or that person. Number three is don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Again, I want to stress, I'm not trying to create this cynical attitude in us. What I'm trying to get at is, is we have a responsibility when we hear anything taught or we hear anything that the Lord is saying, is we have a responsibility to test what is spoken. We have a responsibility to test what was heard and to make sure that we're not misled. Because, Jesus, you know, one of the first things... That G, when the disciples asked, what, what's the sign of your coming in the end of the age? One of the first things Jesus said in Matthew 24 is he said to them, see to it that you are not misled. See to it that you are not deceived. Do you realize that you have a responsibility not to be deceived? And specifically talking about the end of the age, the Lord said, many are going to come in my name saying, I am the Christ. They're not saying they're not saying, they're not, it would not be like me coming here and going, hey, I am Jesus Christ. That's not what I don't think the Lord was saying. In other words, they're going to come in the name of Jesus Christ, like, like someone like me, like a minister of the gospel. I'm coming in the name of Jesus Christ, and they're going to mislead many. You see what I'm saying? They're not going to, I mean, who would really believe, okay, well, that's Jesus Christ. You would have to be, you know, drunk on the Kool-Aid to really believe that. It's more they're coming in the name of Jesus Christ, and they're, they're saying things and teaching things, and what they're saying it either has mixture or it's full of air, and we're not testing it, we're not examining it, and Jesus said, see to it that you're not deceived. It was the first thing the Lord said to his disciples about the end times. Think about that. Wow, that's a big point. 
So when you're listening, when you're listening, what, you know, one of the things I'm, one of the reasons I'm stressing this is because now with the internet, which is great, we can listen to anything we want to listen to on YouTube, podcasts, whatever. And so you're probably, all of us are probably hearing an, uh, just an incredible groundswell of information. And some of the things may be true. Some of the things may not be true. Some of the things may have mixture. But we've got to understand this. Like Romans 11, 29 says, the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. That means when God gives them, he doesn't take them back. So that's why when the Lord said in Matthew chapter 7, many are going to come to me on that day and they're going to be like, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not do miracles in your name? Did we not do cast out demons in your name? And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. You're practicing lawlessness. In other words, what was happening is the gift of God and the call of God that God gave them when they were born again, assuming they were born again, when God gave them those things, those gifts operated even though they were living in sin. Paul Cain could function in a revelatory way even while living in sin. That's why you've got to test it to make sure, okay, what is really the Lord? Because once you go down that path, you're talking about prophetic manipulation. You're talking about twisting of the word of God. You're talking about false teaching, false prophecy, all of that. That's why Jesus said, see to it that you are not misled. We've got to be Bereans. We've got to be students of the scriptures. We've got to be, if we've got to get into the scriptures. We've got to get into the, the scriptures and examine the scriptures in context to see, is the word of God teaching these things? Is this true? Or is this a, a, one man's interpretation of certain things? Number four, this is kind of the, along the same lines, is stop placing ministers on a pedestal. This is a huge problem in the Western church, the cult of personality. I mean, it's, it's not a problem here. I, mean, I probably could use it. No, I'm kidding. A little more honor or something, you know, but I'm, I'm kidding. But it, this is not a problem here as much, but I think all of us can do it with other ministers out there who would be more famous, is that we can put up, put ministers on a pedestal and almost think they're infallible. And the Lord talked about in Isaiah chapter 2, there's coming a day of reckoning. And in that day, the Lord's name is going to be the only name. It's not going to be the big name ministers we always talk about out there. The Lord is going to be the only name. In that day, the Lord is going to be exalted. And the Lord says in there, put away your idols and recognize a day of reckoning is coming and the Lord alone is going to be exalted in that day. Stop regarding man whose breath is in his nostrils. This cult of personality that is so prevalent in the charismatic church. It's, char well, it's in the evangelical church as well. It's in really the whole church. Just, I mean, it's like, it, it, I mean, if you've seen it, and we probably all have done it to some degree, probably none of us are doing that a lot now. But, you know, when you see it, and, you know, it's really a sign of immaturity. Jesus Christ is going to be exalted in that day and no other man. And so, here's the thing that, that happened in Isaiah's day. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. Isaiah said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. And the train of his robe was filling the temple. And after that, Isaiah was commissioned as a prophet by the seraphim coming with the burning coals of fire from the altar of God, Isaiah was commissioned as a prophet of the Lord, but it was not until King Uzziah died that Isaiah received that commission. Uzziah was this leader, this king in Israel who had incredible amounts of success, incredible 
powerful military accomplishments. Prosperity flowed into Israel in, in, a, in an incredible way, and the nation of Israel likely turned Uzziah into an idol, and they likely put their trust in him. And they turned their focus away from the Lord onto a man that God had blessed, and God had blessed him. But Uzziah became proud because of the success, and Uzziah became presumptuous, thinking, well, I have this favor of God on my life. I can then do whatever I want to do. And he went and did what only the priest could do, and he was struck with leprosy, and he was, he was cast away from, from the people for the rest of his life, and God brought him under judgment. And it's when that happened that Isaiah said, when, when King, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. And sometimes the idols of man, even men, great ministers of God, have to come down before we can see the Lord. Before we can see the Lord and recognize that it's the Lord who is speaking, not this man or that man or, th or this other man or woman or whatever. <clears throat> it's the Lord. It's in the year when King Uzziah died that Isaiah saw the Lord and the train of his robe filling the temple. It's when in that time that I, the, the true Word of God and the ultimate purposes for Israel were revealed to the prophet Isaiah. And I believe whenever God brings down the house of Eli, whenever God brings down the old, corrupt, blinded, depraved, uh, corrupted house of Eli, that there's always coming forth after that a Samuel. There's coming forth Samuel ministry. There is coming forth, I'm just, I believe this is the Lord, the word of the Lord for as we enter to 2024, is when the house of Eli comes down, there is coming the Samuel ministry. There is coming a company of Samuels, a company of prophets. Samuel was the prophetic voice that led Israel from transition from the judges to King Saul to King David. Samuel was that transitionary prophet that brought in the true priesthood that brought that was responsible for the bringing down of the house of Eli to bring in the true prophetic word of God to Israel to transition them to the kingdom of David. It's prophetic of the company of prophets God will raise up in these last days who will bring us from the, the kingdom of Saul, the Antichrist, into the kingdom of David, the greater David, Jesus Christ, as we transition from this age known as the church age into the kingdom age. God will raise up prophets, a company of prophets. I believe that the greatest move of God is coming, the greatest prophetic apostolic company we've ever seen is coming. God is raising up forerunner ministers, forerunner vessels to prepare the earth and the church for the second coming of Christ. And it takes time, sometimes when the house of Eli grows blind and corrupt and begins to prosper in the name of Jesus Christ in a, in a corrupt way. I'm not against prosperity in a corrupt way and defiling the house of God through sin that God brings down and he says, Ichabod, the glory has departed. God raises up a Samuel. God raises up a company of Samuels. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I believe there is coming a company of Samuels that are coming to the earth that are, going, that are not interested in the, in the world, not interested in even kingdom success. Their ministry, like Samuel, is before the Lord. Their ministry is to the Lord. They're, they're those that, that hear the voice of God and bring in a new priesthood, a bridal priesthood, the priesthood after the sons of Zadok, the priesthood in the order of Melchizedek, whose ministry is vertical to the Lord. It's not interested in horizontal. Horizontal comes after vertical. But it's in the year that King Uzziah died that the prophet Isaiah was commissioned. It's when the house of Eli is judged, the Samuels come forth. It's when we stop placing ministers on pedestals and we start looking to the Lord that God brings forth a greater revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what we need. That's what God builds his church on is the revelation of Jesus Christ. He doesn't build it on this person's experience, that person's personality, this person's whatever. He builds it on the revelation of Jesus Christ. We need to come back to that foundation of the church that is built on the revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen?
Number five, I'll go through the last two quick, <clears throat> is develop your own relationship with the Lord. How do we get to the right foundation? Develop your own relationship with the Lord. You cannot get the oil from someone else. That's the parable of the ten virgins. That's the warning of Jesus. So, you know, the Lord, the disciples said, what are the signs of your coming of the end of the age? One of the things he started with was see to it no one misleads you. The other thing, he, one of the other things he said is, you've got to get your own oil. You can't live on the oil of your pastor or a leader or your family or your parents or your friends. You can't live on their oil. You've got to get your own oil. See, so much of the problem in the church today is, where, is, is Christians are trying to get oil from someone else. We'll, we'll spend eight hours listening to a YouTube video by this minister or that minister or this apostle or that prophet. We'll spend 10 minutes in the Bible. We'll spend five minutes waiting on the Lord. What are you saying? What are you speaking? I think that's a problem. I'm not against at all people listening to other things, other voices, but... I, I'm just trying to say is, and then there's, a, there's a time in our walk with the Lord where we need those other voices. We need those other leaders. Don't mistake what I'm saying. I'm not saying, you know, abandon all of that and just totally be in the Bible and totally be in the Scriptures. No, God has given leaders and God has given teachers. What I'm trying to get off, get, get to us, though, is our first priority before we go listen to this person or that person, is our first priority is to be in the scriptures. Our first priority is to develop this relationship with the Lord. Our first priority is to pay the price, go to the dealers yourself, buy the oil for yourself so that your own lamp is burning. Because when, when the Lord comes back, the foolish virgins are going to go to the wise virgins and say, give us some of your oil. And the, fool, the wise ones are going to go, that doesn't work that way. You can't just come to me and ask me to lay hands on you or speak a word to you or share something the Lord's saying. You don't, if you don't have your own relationship with the Lord, you're going to miss the Lord here as we move into the end of the age. And so when the Lord came back, when the bridegroom returned, those who were ready went to the wedding feast and those who were not were, were shut outside the door. You've got to develop your own relationship with the Lord. You've got to develop your own ability to hear from the Lord. You've got to develop your own life in, in prayer, you've got to develop your own study of the Word and, and going deep in the Word and understanding what Scriptures are saying and, and just going deep in that. As we head into this new year, I just want to encourage you, if you're into New Year's resolutions, make this your New Year's resolution, that I will develop my own relationship with the Lord like never before. I, you know, where God wants to bring us is into interdependence. We're not dependent on leaders. We're not dependent on teachers. We're dependent on the Lord. But there is an interdependence. That's the, that's the healthy way the body of Christ is meant to function together is there's an interdependence as we have our own relationship with the Lord. We're pressing into the Lord ourselves. We're going deep in prayer, deep in communion, deep in the study of scriptures, and we're going deep in the Lord ourselves. But then when we come together, we have this interdependence it's because some things God doesn't speak well, many things, God will only speak corporately and not just individually. So if you're off in this me and Jesus prayer closet, a lot of times you're not going to hear the corporate of what God wants to speak because God speaks corporately. So it's this interdependence God wants to bring. Number six is when, when God is judging his house, we must search our own heart and repent where necessary. This is not about, when, when leaders fall, this is not about self-righteousness. This is not about accusation or judgment or criticism. It's what Paul said, if any man thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. This is not the time in the church to be like, okay, yeah, this, this man of God fell, or this man of God did this. It's more like, and that's not been my attitude at all. That's, our attitude needs to be, with the fear of God, examining our own hearts and repenting, living a, a place of, in a place of repentance. Lord, what is it in me, you know, examining me, you know, what, what is it in me that, that could fall? You know, Lord, where, where, how am I, you know, doing certain things? Lord, am I, am I believing certain lies? Do I have these flesh patterns or whatever it would be? that I need to repent of. 
pride, jealousy, lust, self, or, uh, judgment, criticism, whatever it would be, you know, not pointing the finger in accusation against someone who's fallen, but looking here and saying, God, put a fear of the Lord in me. Lord, like it talks about in, in Hebrews chapter 12, pursue sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Only the pure in heart will see God. Like, God, I, I do not want to, I do not, I want clean hands and a pure heart. I, I, want, I, want, I don't want anything in me of the flesh and my weakness to defile. I want to live a holy life. That's where I'm coming from. That's where we need to come from. For I'll, I'll end with this scripture. Is 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14. Peter said, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. If you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear. So that mean, means the fear of the Lord. During the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. As, as Peter is saying, be holy, for I am holy. Live your life in fear. Not, of course, that doesn't mean like the spirit of fear. It means the fear of God. To live your life in the fear of God, knowing the price Jesus paid to purchase your salvation. Knowing the price Jesus paid as the atoning propitiatory, propitiatory sacrifice, the atoning sacrifice that Jesus became, that where he became sin and was judged by God so that you, as you could receive his salvation and his forgiveness, his blood. And, and Peter's saying, don't regard this as something common. This is, a, this is the precious blood of the lamb. Don't live your life in self-centeredness and selfishness and living by the flesh because you are redeemed with precious blood. It cost the son of God his entire life to bring you near to God. Don't regard the blood of the covenant by which you were sanctified as a common thing and sin and live a lifestyle of sin. Be holy because I am holy. Live in the fear of God that we would not want to ever displease the Lord, displease him. God, help us. I'll just close here, just prayer. Asking the Lord to help us in this last point. I pray, Lord, as we head into 2024, may the fear of the Lord increase. Lord, I'm asking you, Lord, let the fear of the Lord increase in our lives. Lord, that we would live a holy life before you. That we would walk the straight and the narrow path of obedience to the words of Jesus. Lord, I'm asking you, Lord, that we would be holy because you're holy. Lord, that you would just put within us, you would shine your light into our hearts, Lord where there's anything of self, anything of the self-life that would try to gain or manipulate or control or live and that we would come back to the crucified life. I have been crucified with Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Lord, let more than ever the, the cross of Jesus Christ be applied experientially to us. 
Lord, so that we could live the crucified life and we could live by your indwelling life. I no longer living, but Christ in me living. Lord, I pray that you would just bring, Lord, as you're exposing things hidden in the church, I pray that you would expose things hidden in our heart. Lord, that you would do that. I'm not talking about public exposure. I mean, just reveal those things to us, those patterns, the, the ways, the thinking patterns, the, the, the lust and jealousy and judgment and selfishness and pride. Lord, I just pray that your, your two-edged sword would penetrate. And Lord, you would come and penetrate into our hearts, bringing that revelation of the two-edged sword of the word of the Lord, that living and active word, that we might be clean and holy and pure before you, Lord. I pray that, Lord, put the fear of the Lord in us. Just ask the Lord right now. Just agree with me in prayer. Put the fear of the Lord in us. We've lost it, Lord. We've lost the fear of the Lord. Let us realize that we were redeemed with the precious blood of the Lamb. Let us not regard the blood of the covenant by which we were sanctified as common, as just the blood shed by any man. But we would realize the eternal Son of God became a man incarnated in human flesh forever. God dying in our place. His blood shed for our sins. God, that we could approach a holy God by the blood of the Lamb. And let us live in the fear of God. Lord, in the fear of of doing anything that would displease you, Lord, doing anything that would offend you, doing anything, Lord, that would defile our lives. Like it talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves of all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. I pray that in the name of Jesus, Lord. Let us start this year in repentance. Lord, where the church around the world has tried to water down repentance because it's not a popular message and it doesn't grow the church, let us be a people of repentance. Not just confessing our sins, but repenting. A mindset change that leads to a change in behavior and lifestyle. Lord, let us be a people of repentance. Lord, even release to us a spirit of repentance, not where we just, just are miserable all the time, but Lord, truly, we're truly living sensitive to you, Lord. We're truly living tender to you. I pray that, Lord. Repenting in the slightest of things, Lord, let us truly live in that light of repentance, Lord. Pray that. Let us just start this year with clean hands and a pure heart. Just take some time now. The Lord shows you things in the presence of the Lord, whether you're online or in, in person. of areas of repentance. Well, we want to please you. That's, what, that's all we want. Let's not be casual in how we live before you.
Lord, we reject this hyper-grace teaching that says because Jesus died for our sins, you're okay with us living in them. That's nonsense. Lord, let the fire of your spirit burn in our hearts, Lord. The spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. Let us be like the gold refined by fire, Lord, that we might be like that pure gold, we pray. Lord, I pray that as we enter into this new year that we would see the Lord as our idols come down. We would see the Lord high and lifted up. Lord, we ask you for those things, Lord. Pray that we would leave this place filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the spirit of holiness. I'm just asking you, Holy Spirit, you are the spirit of holiness. Would you fill us, Lord, with your presence right now? The holiness of God. And I pray that we would build our lives on the right foundation. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone listening online and everyone in person. Hope you have an incredible New Year. I guess if you have any sinister plans on New Year's Eve, I just ruined those for you. Um, that's good. But uh, just seriously, I hope everyone has an awesome, blessed new year with friends and family. And we're ready to start 2024 on the right foot. Amen. And uh, be blessed. If you need any prayer, we'll be up front uh, to pray for anyone. If you need a healing or breakthrough or anything like that, we'll be praying for you. We'll be happy to pray for you. And remember the uh, tithe basket in the back. And uh, 